Sir Humphrey Gilbert's fame in St. John's, Newfoundland. To find out firsthand just how famous Sir Humphrey Gilbert was in Newfoundland, I made a three-day road trip, plus an 11-hour ferry ride, to the city of St. John's. First, here's some background information. In the year 1497, King Henry VII hired Italian navigator Giovanni Caboto, which got anglicized to John Cabot, to explore the northern coast of North America. Tradition holds that Cabot entered the magnificent St. John's Harbor in Newfoundland on June 24, 1497, which most Europeans celebrated as St. John's Day, or Midsummer, or the Summer Solstice. Modern scholars, however, think Cabot actually first made landfall about 75 miles further north at Bonavista Peninsula, and it was the Portuguese fishermen who named the harbor São João, or St. John's. Five years later, in 1501, Gaspar Real explored St. John's Harbor for King Manuel of Portugal. Aside from these official land claims, it's well documented that starting around 1500, many Portuguese, Basque, French, from Normandy and Brittany, and English fishermen made annual voyages to Newfoundland. The codfish on the Grand Banks were so plentiful, the sea was thick with them, but few of these fishermen wintered over. They arrived in the spring, fished for several months, and returned home before the hurricane season in the late summer. The transatlantic route was fairly simple. After heading due west, the ships would eventually cross the warm blue waters of the Gulf Stream. They knew they had crossed it, because then they would hit the cooler, darker waters of the Labrador Current. The first place seen was usually Cape Race, the southeasternmost point of the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland. The sailors had to keep a sharp eye peeled for Cape Race because this confluence of the cold and warm currents creates a dense fog. For about one third of the days of the year, Cape Race is shrouded in fog, and over the years it has been the site of many shipwrecks. The name Cape Race probably derived from the Portuguese term Capo Rasso. There is a cape with the same name at the mouth of the Tagus River. Portugal's largest river, which flows west from uh, Lisbon. Rosso means bare or treeless, and indeed there are no trees at all on Cape Race. Long ago, a glacier scraped all the topsoil into the sea. Incidentally, in 1912, the wireless station at Cape Race was the first to receive the distress call from the RMS Titanic. Just north of Cape Race are two picturesque natural harbors, Renews and Fermus. The French first came to Renews in 1504. And guess who landed in Renews after the transatlantic voyage of 1620? That's right, the pilgrims on the Mayflower. After a few days rest, then they headed south, got caught up in the arm of Cape Cod, and settled in Plymouth. In French, Renews means rocky bottom. Fermus most likely derives from the French word for beauty, Fermosa. Further north, up the coast from Renews and Fermus, is St. John's Harbor. Though it's not quite as close to the fishing grounds of the Grand Banks, it offers better protection than the other harbors. Its entranceway is quite deep, and it's guarded by two tall hills with steep cliffs. When Sir Humphrey Gilbert crossed the Atlantic in 1583, his four ships in his fleet got separated in the fog. They had previously agreed to rendezvous at St. John's Harbor. The smallest ship, the Squirrel, was the first to arrive. But the harbor was hardly empty. There were 36 fishing sh ships there. 16 were Portuguese or Spanish, and 20 were French or English. Even though some of these countries were in conflict in Europe, here the fishermen had a civil society. They were all out just to make a living. Each week a, a new admiral of the harbor was selected. The current admiral had forbidden the Squirrel entrance to the harbor, fearing that they were pirates. Suddenly, when three larger vessels laden with cannons loomed into sight, the admiral guarding the harbor became quite concerned. Gilbert dispatched a messenger to the row to through a rowboat, who explained that they had a commission from the queen, and they were coming with no ill intent. Besides, Gilbert wasn't the type of guy to take no for an answer, especially after he had had such a rough sea crossing. The admiral finally acquiesced and allowed Gilbert's ships to proceed into the mouth of the harbor. 
the narrow entranceway, required experienced maneuvering for a big galleon like the Delight, and shortly Gilbert found his ship embarrassingly stuck on a rock. After a few good chuckles, the fishermen guarding the entry helped out by anchoring their boats and winching the 120-ton ship free. Incidentally, the obtrusive rocks just below the surface were removed several years ago to allow huge cruise ships to enter into the harbor. Once in the harbor, Gil Gilbert summoned all the ship captains aboard the Delight. He showed them his letters patent from the Queen. As the new governor, he informed the leaders of their duty to help repair the expedition's vessels and supply food and clothing. He also explained that he was not going to be staying long, as he was anxious to proceed further south. The fishing captains re returned to their boats and simultaneously fired off their large cannons as a token of welcome. Gilbert's fleet was immediately provided with fresh salmon, trout, lobster, and fresh cod. Gilbert explained that there would be three laws that would take place immediately. The official religion was to be the Church of England. Anyone who prejudices the Queen's right to possession would be judged by the laws of England and if found guilty of high treason would be executed. And the third law was anyone speaking dishonorably about the Queen would lose his ship, his property, and have his ears cut off. Then Gilbert had a wooden pillar erected upon which was affixed the arms of England engraved in lead. Gilbert had one of his crew present him with a ceremonial rod and a piece of local turf. Then Gilbert granted to the various ship captains, in exchange for annual rents, parcels of land surrounding the harbor. This parceling was particularly welcomed by the English fishermen because they processed cod using the dry method. The fish fillets were allowed to dry and cure on long tables that lined the shore. The Portuguese and Spanish preferred the wet method, salting the fillets in aboard the ship and packing them in tightly in barrels because they had more salt avail to, available to them. The purpose of my visit to St. John's was to see just how important Sir Humphrey Gilbert's visit was in Canadian history. Of the many Canadians I asked, do you know who Sir Humphrey Gilbert is? A scant 10% had ever even heard of him. Local historians have put him on a pedestal for founding the British Empire right in St. John's Harbor, but the truth is he never intended to set up a colony in St. John's. His intended destination was Narragansett Bay, Verrazano's Refugio, or the Dee River and Port of 1583. But still, he is credited with ruling the land for two weeks, as one caption reads, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, Governor of Canada, August 2nd to August 19th, 1583. Indeed, he did lay claim for the land for Queen Elizabeth, but he hardly colonized the place. It appears like the fishermen put up with his antics for two weeks, knowing full well he would be soon on his way. On a high hill overlooking St. John's and its dramatic harbor are the rooms. The name and the design comes from the steep roofed fishing rooms where the fishermen of old would process their catch. But these new large scaled rooms house a modern art gallery, a wonderful museum, and the Center for Newfoundland Studies Archives. In the archives database, I found out about 50 books and 25 magazine and newspaper articles on Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Most of the articles were a rehash of the basic Gilbert story, and none of them explained that Gilbert was only stopping over in St. John's before heading down south to the Dee River. None of the articles even mentioned Sir George Peckham and the Catholic colony that he was funding. Only one article mentions John Dee. It was called The Wizard and the Knight by Frank Rasky. Dee was the wizard and Gilbert was the knight. <laughs> 